Good morning, everyone. Welcome to World History One. We're going to start with the basics of geography because that is, as we know, a social science and also extremely important when we're thinking about anything that we're going to do in World History One. We're always looking at how humans interact with the environment, but we also want to know where they are and be able to find them on a map. So what specifically is geography? Well, when you break down the root of the word, geo is earth, and so graphy is the study of, like ology is. So in essence, it's the study of our earth or anything that can be mapped. And one of the important things you're thinking about geography, it's not just the physical, but it's also the people, the places, the culture, anything that is on our earth. So it mixes up both the physical and human aspects. So when you think about it, there is physical geography, which is like the mapping. When I took a physical geography class in college, like I literally would get a quiz that had like a hundred matching things on it where we we're matching up places on a map. And then my cultural geography class, we studied religions and languages and what people look like in those different regions. So ultimately, geography is all about relationships. It's about relationships with people and the earth, people in their environment. So we're going to start with looking at the five themes of geography. And if you notice at this map, hopefully when you saw those colors, you're like, oh, this is mostly the seven continents. The exception here, of course, is where they have the Middle East or Southwest Asia as a separate color, when in reality it's part of Asia. <laughs> so the five themes of geography are basically a way of looking at the earth and basically anything that we have, geographers can ask one of these questions. And they ultimately are guided by two questions, where are things located and why are they there? And so they use five themes to organize. You are going to have a little quiz on the themes afterwards. I'll give you a scenario, you tell me which theme it is. So if you want to take notes, feel free. So the first theme is location. It tells us where you are on Earth. And there's two types of location. There's absolute location, which is exact coordinates of latitude and longitude, like exactly where you are. Like we could look up what the latitude and longitude is for Bedford, Virginia. GPS works by using absolute location. But if we're not using GPS, when we're giving directions to people, we are often use what we call relative location. And it's based on where it is in relation to other places. Like if I was to tell you how to get to the Southern States Co-op, well, you know, it's over there close to where like Taco Bell and Sonic is. And if you're coming from the school, it's right before you get to the Taco Bell. If you're coming from town, it's right after you get to the Taco Bell. When we're giving things in relation to other places. So, oh, well, you know, Lynchburg is uh, south and east of Bedford. That would also be an example of relative location. We're not going to focus a lot on latitude and longitude this year. It is a skill that's good to know. But my more concern is that you can find places on a map, not necessarily with latitude and longitude. Um, and relative location is, is very important to what we're doing for our work. So if I say Bedford, Virginia, and I don't give you the, um, if I don't give you the address, if I don't give you the GPS, then that is relative location. If I tell you that my house is beside a Trinity Baptist Church, it's behind the Kentucky Fried Chicken, then that is relative location. If I say that I live at 1008 Pinecrest Avenue, then that is my absolute location. Place, <clears throat> in place we're talking about kind of thinking about like, well, what is it like there? Place is looking at the physical characteristics and human characteristics. So when I think about describing Bedford, if I think about place, I would say, oh, well, you know, the Peaks of Otter or the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, it's near Smith Mountain Lake. We are in the Bible Belt. We're a predominantly Christian community. Um, we speak English. So any kind of characteristics you're using to describe a place. When I lived in Turkey, they spoke Turkish. 99% or 98% of the population were Muslim. As I'm looking around, not only are there the physical characteristics of, say, uh, the mountains that were near me, but there also was man-made characteristics like moss and other kind of buildings that were built to adapt to the climate. So place, <clears throat> basically thinking about what describes somewhere. 
Human environment interaction is probably your easiest one because it's how the human environment interact. Like right now, we've got big fires raging in California that spread to some other states. Uh, Hurricane Laura just hit Louisiana. How do we respond to that? How do we rebuild from that? Why are buildings built different in California and Japan than they are in Virginia? Because of they need to be earthquake proof. And so they actually build them differently so that they can withstand a little bit of shaking. When I moved to North Carolina when I was in eighth grade, I thought it was so weird because everybody had a basement here in Bedford and in, uh, in, in Virginia. And I grew up in Manita in Bedford County. And I moved to North Carolina and we lived in eastern North Carolina. Nobody had a basement. Uh, the reason is because basically if you dig more than six feet, you hit water. And so they couldn't build basements in the way that they could here in Virginia. So here's an example of a dam. We have Smith Mountain Lake Dam, of course which we use for hydroelectric power. And this is a way that we are in in interacting with the environment. Even like the clothes that you choose to wear, all those kind of things are part of interacting uh, with the environment. You can see how farmland has been cut out. If we were looking at some places in say South America, they actually do what we call terrace farming as a result of, of that because the soil is so rocky. Movement is movement of people or goods or ideas. Uh, this is one of my favorite world history words. You're gonna hear that a lot from me and that is cultural diffusion. And so cultural diffusion is the spread of ideas and it usually comes through trade. For example, Buddhism did not start in China, but that's where it's predominantly today, China, Japan. It actually started in India and there's not very many Buddhists in India today. So how did it get from one place to the other? Well, there was a leader called Ahsoka and he sent missionaries. Those missionaries left India and they went to China and they spread Buddhism. Also, when we think about movement of people, we can think about immigration or immigration. So immigration with an I are people coming into a country and immigration with an E are people leaving a country. So Mexico actually has a problem with both things. They have a problem with immigration from the South. There are countries that are in worse situations in Mexico, specifically places from Guatemala. People are coming into Mexico illegally. They have the same problem that we do on the other side of the border, and they want to come into Mexico for a better life. On the other hand, Mexico also has people exiting their country. Okay, so they've got the immigration in the South coming into their country, and then they have Mexican people who are exiting their country uh, in order to go to uh, the United States. And so Mexico suffers from actually both of these types of issues. You also, for example, while talking about Mexico, the majority of Mexicans are Catholic Christians, and that's because they were settled by the Spain, by the Spanish, and so the Spanish brought Christianity with them. So why people immigrate or immigrate, it has to do with push or pull factors. So it may be something that makes you want to leave a place or something that makes you want to go to that place. So sometimes it could be both. So people who are coming to our country, say like from Mexico, who are looking for uh, more financial stability, and that may be why they want to come, because they're having trouble on their own. Uh, people who are refugees from, say, Syria, their country is war-torn and it's not safe. So there's a push to make them leave, and they don't necessarily care where they go. They just want to get out of Syria. So regions is another way that we can divide um, places in the world. Think about where do we live? What region do we live? We live in the South, right? That's one of the regions of the United States. So it's a way to divide the world. It could be physical or cultural aspects. And so when you think about the South, it's, it is kind of a physical that we're the Southern states, but we also have a cultural link, right? We have similar language styles um, and we have similar culture. Those are things that distinguish us. For example, a lot of you probably like sweet tea, and if you've ever traveled outside of the South, you'll notice that they don't have sweet tea most places. I remember when I went to Chicago the first time, I ordered an Arnold Palmer, which is lemonade and tea, and I was like, oh, why does this taste so bad? And that was because it wasn't made with sweet tea. So um, when I went to Kansas, it was the same thing. I'm like, um, do they sell sweet tea anywhere? And she's like, yeah, maybe McDonald's. <laughs> so uh, it just kind of depends, you know, where you are. Physical regions could be deserts, rainforests, tidal basins, like we have the Chesapeake Bay area in Virginia. You could think about um, also like the Appalachian Mountains. It could be regions, describe that way as well. 
cultural, we think a lot about what unites people. So it could be like language. It could be people's ethnicity. Uh, it could also be religion. And so like, for example, another thing, we, what other region we live in the Bible belt here. If you're unfamiliar with that term, the Bible belt, there are a lot of churches in our area. And if you go to other parts of the country, you will not see as many churches as you do located in the Bible belt. All right, so our earth is divided into hemispheres, and these are terms that we need to know when I'm talking about north and southern hemispheres. We're going to spend a lot of our year talking about the eastern hemisphere, so we're going to be focusing a lot on Europe and Africa because our course goes up until 1500, which means that the Americas aren't discovered by Columbus until 1492. Now, yes, we will talk about the Vikings and how that... Um, uh, Leif Erikson actually did come to the Americas first. He came to Canada, but he was quiet. He didn't want to tell anybody about this amazing place that he had found. All right, so let's talk a little bit about maps. So maybe this map looks a little weird to you. Um, and that's because it's nice to us to look at map at different projections. Uh, there's no reason why south can't be at the top of your map. And so this is, of course, a map with south at the top instead of north. And so if you notice that your directional indicator here, your compass rose, that it just says south. Now, I call this a directional indicator because it only has the S. When you see just an arrow and just an S or an N, it's called a directional indicator. If it actually would have south, uh, east, west, north, then it becomes a compass rose. So you can still see your continents and everything, but looking at it this way, maybe helps to see that, oh, Australia just isn't that little bottom piece on the map, but it's actually kind of central here. So maps are flat representations of the Earth. So the problem is our Earth is round. I've included a video for you to watch afterward that really describes a distortion really well. And how that, um, and if you pay attention to the video, they, they zoom in on Montvale. It's kind of funny. So when we talk about our world, it's round. It's a sphere. And so when you try to take something round, and make it flat, you're going to end up with what we call distortion. And so if you've ever been to, say, um, one of those places that has like the funny mirrors where it like stretches you out or makes you shorter, uh, those are, are wider or skinnier, that's called distortion, when something is inaccurate in its shape and size. Every single map, by definition, has distortion because you cannot take a round world and make it flat without distortion. It is impossible. Okay, so I want you to say that again. Every map has distortion. So our goal is, is to limit distortion. So this is the most common map that we see. This is called the Mercator projection. It's actually one of the most inaccurate, uh, but there's a reason. So this was designed with sailors in mind. This map was designed for navigation. So what you're going to see is that it is really based on where latitude and longitude is. Now I want you to notice as you get further north, notice how the latitude lines get further and further apart. And that is to show the distortion. Now this is what is good about this map. The shape sizes, like the size not, not the size, that size like how big, but the shape. The shape of Greenland, the shape of North America, the shape of Africa is fairly accurate. What is inaccurate on this map is the size. Greenland actually fits into Africa 14 times. Greenland is 14 times smaller than Africa. It does not at all look like that on this map. They look almost equal. The problem with looking at this type of map all the time in classrooms is that it gives us a bias and we think oh Greenland's huge Antarctica's huge and we display the size and importance of Africa and South America this is an unintended consequence this is an implicit bias that we don't even realize that we have when we're looking at a map so there's some other options for the Mercator what else could we use well, here's a couple more. So we have the interrupted projection, which really work to cut down on dist and distortion. You know, if you're trying to take a round thing and make it flat, you got to cut pieces out. So they did this cutting. Here's the problem with this, is it really distorts distance, okay? So remember, the Mercator is designed for distance. It has accurate or fairly accurate shape, but inaccurate size. 
And then when we're looking at the interval projection, it's the distance that is the issue. Here we have the equal area projection, which is not too bad. It's pretty close to the Robinson, which is my favorite we're going to talk about in a minute. But I want us to look at the Peters here. The Peters is basically the opposite of the Mercator, how the Mercator is accurate shape but inaccurate size. It's opposite with Peters. Peters actually has accurate size. But look at South America and Africa. Ooh, they are stretched out. They look a little odd, right? That's because that's where their distortion is. Their distortion is the shape. But for the first time now, Mexico looks larger than Alaska because it is. Poor little Greenland. I bet I could shove that into Africa at least 14 times. Okay. So now we are getting to see how things really look. And so the Peters actually does a much better representation of showing the true size of Africa, the true size of South America, how small Europe is, okay? So it's important when we're thinking about what types of maps even we have in our classrooms. So the map that you're gonna see me use the most often is the Robinson. This is my favorite projection, uh, projection because it seeks to make a happy medium. So we're looking at more traditionally, like more accurate uh, shape. So Africa's not like really strung out. And we're working to get the, the size also more accurate. Now, Greenland, maybe it won't fit in here exactly 14 times, but it's pretty close, okay? Uh, it, Mexico looks like it's probably a little bit bigger than Alaska, so it's not perfect. Okay, no map is perfect because every map has distortion. But this map, because of the curves, because of the curved longitude lines, this seeks to decrease distortion and this, in essence, makes a more correct map. Still has distortion, but it is more correct shape and size. So when we're thinking about maps and any maps that we make in our class, there's a little acronym that I use, and that is that good maps have totals with a D instead of a T. So good maps have totals, which stands for title, orientation, which is your compass rose or directional indicator, date, author, legend, and scale. It's important to have the title and date because this tells us the time period for when the map was done. It's also good to know who. So the title tells the purpose of the map. Lots of different things can come from the title. And the titles are going to be very important in the maps that we do, especially when we're looking at historical maps. And then you have the compass rows. Your cardinal directions are north, east, south, and west. And then your um, intermediate directions are north, east, south, east, south, west, north, west. And if you just use an arrow with an N, that's called a directional indicator. Your legend, or key, tells you all the important things on the map. And then scale is super important for distance. All right, so we are now going to review our continents and oceans. So this map's a little better than that first one that we used. Not only does it have the continents by colors, so we have North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, and then Antarctica down here. Then we have our five oceans, the Arctic, Pacific, Atlantic, Southern, and Indian. Remember, the Pacific would wrap around there. So here's a list of your continents. We're going to be doing a map activity with these later. So we have North America. North America does include Greenland. Okay. So continents are large land masses that are separated by a large feature. So Greenland falls in with here because it's separated by the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans from the rest of Europe. It starts here, Greenland, Canada, Alaska, goes all the way down through Panama, including the islands of the Greater and Lesser Antilles and the Caribbean Ocean. It's Caribbean Sea, excuse me. South America starts here with Colombia, includes Brazil, Argentina, etc. Africa, including the coast of Madagascar, and it's here at the Sinai Peninsula where the Suez Canal is. That is what separates Africa from the rest of Europe and Asia. Antarctica, this is a polar view, so we can see here the shape of our Antarctica, which then you can see how really close it is to South America. Here's Europe. We're going to spend a lot of time in Europe uh, this year. And 
we will spend even more time here in Asia. So you can see the Middle East here or Southwest Asia, because if you go west and south, or south and west, that's the Middle East. Here's where I lived in Turkey. India is going to be very important for us, China, Japan. Then we have Australia, or also known as Oceania, because it not only Australia, but including um, Indonesia as well as Papua New Guinea, New Zealand. So when we look at land area, Asia is the largest and the smallest is Australia, though Australia and Europe aren't that much difference in size. Sometimes I think when we look at a map, we forget like the real accurate sizes, um, especially when we're looking at maps that are distorted. So here we have. So I tried to do the ones I thought you could easily recognize. So number one is, of course, Africa. Number two is North America. Number three, South America. Number four, Australia. Number five, Europe. Number six, Antarctica. And number seven, Asia. Bodies of water, we have the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Arctic, the Indian, and the most recent ocean, the Southern Ocean, which they decided to start using that um, kind of around 2000. And so it started showing up on lots of maps more closer to around 2005 and such. So if you buy any modern map, that's kind of a way to tell how the date on a map, whether or not the Southern Ocean is labeled. And you can see all the oceans here. Remember, it is the Arctic Ocean, not the Antarctic Ocean, because Antarctica is here in the south below the Southern Ocean, so it's the Arctic Ocean. All right, and so that sums up everything we need to know for our basis of geography. You have two activities you're going to do. You're going to do the five themes of geography, so if you want to go back and review those real quickly. And then you are also going to do a uh, map activity where we're going to be labeling lots of different things. And if you have any problem with the text boxes or how you need to do anything in Google Slides, just send me a message and I will be happy to meet and talk with you about it.